Okay, so welcome to day one. So if you were in lab, today would be the day that you are making the particles, basically. So you've um, already seen some of the background theory, some of the big picture goals. So uh, maybe we can talk right now about some of the equipment that you would have been using. Uh, the first is a pipette. So I know a lot of you have been in research labs, but a lot of you haven't. And so um, what this is designed to do is to deliver controlled amounts of material. So um, I'm gonna let the zoom go in and you can see this number. And so how you read this is the red digit is your highest digit. And so how do I know the range that this pipette can work in? Well, it tends to be on the tip. And so if you can read that, it says, to get it focused, up to 1,000. So that is a P1000, and there you can kind of see at the top um, where it says, what, 60 to 1,000 microliters. And so that's the range that it can work in. So you don't want to work outside of that range. So. Right now, if I twist this knob at the top, nothing's changing here. So I have to kind of pull it. And when I pull it, now if I rotate, you can hopefully appreciate that the numbers are changing. Okay? So I'm going to set it to 0.72 and then push this back down to lock it. Okay? So, there are all different sizes of pipettes. So, um, here are a couple other ones. So, uh, this one is a P200, so it can go up to 200 microliters. This one's a P20, so this is for 2 to 20 microliters. So, the main thing that people do wrong with a pipette is how they withdraw and release liquid. Okay, so a pipette doesn't work very well without a tip. So, tips come in a box, you press down on it. At the end, you push down gently on this little lever and it kicks it off, okay? So, one thing you can do is kind of pull the pipette tip off yourself. That's generally bad news bears. So just gently kick it off when you're done. The other thing is um, people use this um, handle lever incorrectly. So if you can sense, hopefully, when I press down, there's a stopping point. But I can still press a little further. That's bad news bears. Um, so you just want to go until you get to the first kind of resting point. Okay? So let's talk about then... Um, withdrawing some liquid into a tube. So this is just water. Um, and so I'm going to just gently depress till it comes to its first resting point. I'm going to place the pipette in the sample and then I'm going to slowly release and up it comes. Okay? So a couple things that people do wrong is they just release it like that. Right? And when you release it like that, it um, will form an air bubble. So you want to gently release it as you withdraw material into your pipette tip. Another thing that people will sometimes do is remove it before it's all the way withdrawn. And so here you can appreciate that there's a bubble and you haven't filled it up all the way. Okay, so just slowly. And then when you release, slowly press it and it should completely evacuate. Okay. So that's kind of the basics of um, this equipment. So if we dive right into our um, module, which you all have, um, a written protocol, on day one, it says label a 15L tube with your, your group number. There's only one group <laughs> and today's date. Now add 1.43 mLs of T-MOMs. So here is our T-MOMs, tetramethyl 
ex excuse me, trimethoxymethylsilane. Okay? So when you open this, you'll notice that it has this septum. So why do you think this has a septum? Do you think you're keeping things in or keeping things out? The answer is that you're actually keeping things out. And what do you think you're keeping out? It's the humidity in the air, right? So the water in the air can uh, react with this silane and degrade it. And so that's why it's protected with this um, septum. So how do I do this, right? Like I can't, I can't stab this septum with this um, pipette tip. So what I'm gonna do is uh, use a needle. If I look at my protocol, it says I need 1.43 mLs. So that's a pretty tough number to measure with a syringe. So I'm just gonna draw out a little extra, maybe three mLs. And so tilt it upside down, and then I'm just gonna gently pull. And then I'm going to place it in this temporary container. And I'm going to immediately label it. It's the number one rule. Nothing ever unlabeled. Okay, so now I still am on part 1B. Add 1.43 mLs of T-MOMs. So there's a couple ways I could do this. I could change this to 1,000 microliters, which is 1 mL, and then change it again to 430 microliters, or I could just have it be roughly 0.715. So that's what I changed it to. Okay? So and then I can do it twice without having to be fiddling with this. So once we finish, we can compare seven to seven. So seven to four to seven to seven. And we can also compare six to seven. To three point five seven mils of water. So now I'm gonna do point five seven first. Point. Point five seven. And now yeah. I'm going to change it to full. So this is what it looks like if it's a, a full milliliter. Okay, so I need three of these. One, two, three. So I don't need to change my pipette tip in between each pole, right? Because it's the same material. If I was moving to a different sample, I would definitely change the pipette tip. Okay, so step 1B, note the miscibility. So let's see if we can get this. Let me get my face out of the way. Focus. Is it not focused? It's, it's focused. There, you go. there, okay. So hopefully you can appreciate that there is one layer floating on top of the other. See the little meniscus there? Okay. 
<clears throat> vortex briefly. What's a vortex? Well, let's see if we can find it. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> This is called a vortex, and you basically just push down on it, and it's going to shake the hell out of it. And so it's a little bit cloudy because I've, I've kind of made an uh, emulsion, but if we give it enough time, it will definitely settle out again because these are completely um, immiscible materials. Okay? Add 5 mLs of 2 normal, I'm sorry, 2 millimolar HCl. So new material, new pipette tip. So we're going to add... One... Two... Seven is the uh, the is for three, four, five. Four texts for five seconds. Yeah, basically something something like that. So now that kind of cloudy color has disappeared. We really no longer have an emulsion because the acid has hydrolyzed our silane. Okay, and so now it's soluble. So we're going to let this react for about 15 minutes. So now we're on to part two, where we are going to prepare the most of the particles that we're going to use for imaging. Um, so what I have is a 50 ml tube. That's part 2A. I've added 21 mils of water and 3 mils of PBS. And then on step 2C, I've added 3 mls of PEI. And as you recall from the lecture, PEI is polyethylamine, and that is our base that's going to catalyze this sol gel reaction. So the very next step is going to be adding in the silica, the hydrolyzed T-moms. And so 6 mLs of that. And so <clears throat> one, of course I could have used a graduated cylinder, but I've already set up shop. So let's carefully record the start time. And then I'm going to vortex it, but I want you to appreciate this color. It's pretty transparent. Right. And so we're going to come back. Um, we're going to take a sample of this. We're going to go put it into the spectrophotometer, and we're going to monitor that color change over time. Okay. So here we are, about um, seven minutes into the growth of these particles. The this is the the big batch from step two right here. I'm just holding a tube of water next to it for comparison. So in the background, we're monitoring the absorbance change over time. We're measuring the color change over time in a quantitative way. But I just wanted to show you what this looks like about seven minutes into the reaction. These are the, the seeds of our particles forming. But what I'm showing you here is section three. So day one, part three, where we're monitoring the reaction, okay? And so the way we're going to monitor the reaction is we're going to look at how much light is absorbed and scattered. So what I just showed you, how the tube is changing color, right? A cloudy tube is going to absorb and scatter more light than a transparent tube, right? That's just basic, um, basic optical principles. But this we're going to use to quantitate it, and we're going to quantitate it over time. 
So this is one of the three spectrophotometers that I showed you when we did the introduction to absorption spectroscopy. Um, so again, you can see back here, there's the bulb all lit up, and so that's producing light. Um, and then the light's gonna travel down here to a wavelength selector and a slit. It's gonna bounce over here to a mirror. It's going to go in here where our sample lives and then there's a detector right here. Okay, so I'm gonna fire up the software. And I'm gonna come up to scan lambda. Actually, I'm gonna change my mind. I'm gonna do time drive. And I'm gonna do 50 samples. And I'm gonna measure it at about, um, let's say 450. And I wanna measure it every 60 seconds for, actually it's a pretty quick measurement. Let's get lots, let's get nice data. Let's measure it every 30 seconds for 600 seconds. Okay, so that's for an hour. So I'm gonna measure it every 30 seconds for one hour. Um, 60, that's 3,600. Thank you. <laughs> oh, here I can change this. Two for minutes, so I can do it for 60 minutes for 30 seconds. Okay. Now I think when I hit start, it's gonna want to take a blank. So I'm gonna put a, a blank cuvette in here. So you're familiar with blanks. In it goes. So this is a really bad way of saying do the blank. It says remove the sample, then press OK to do 100% T, zero absorbance correction, auto zero. So all of those words are kind of like saying the blank, but not exactly saying the blank. But this is what it wants you to do, is run a blank. So if you keep your eye up here, it moved to the wavelength I told it to, 450. Now it's ready for the sample, because now we're at 0% absorbance. So this is a replicate of the big sample that I just made, and I'm gonna take out the blank and put in my sample. So right now, the sample's completely transparent, right? So now I'm gonna hit go. Time so far. So you can see our time elapsed right here. So it's gonna wait, I think, until it gets to 30 seconds and then take a measurement. So you can use these 10 seconds to meditate or however you would like. You can use it to check your phone. <laughs> but we're coming back in three, two, one. Okay, bummer. Let's stop this. 
So I switched this over to kind of a real-time measurement. And so what you can see right here is our absorbance has gone up from 0A to 0.7. And this is about two minutes into the experiment. Okay, so we are coming up on a little more than 35 minutes um, into this uh, process. And so as you remembered at the beginning, we started at zero and then we were about at 0 0.07 and now we're at about 2.87. And so um, this is the data that I recorded. I'm gonna scan this sheet and uh, let you punch it into Excel yourself. Um, so this is the time in 24-hour uh, time. So 15.38 is when we started at zero, 15.39 at zero. And then as time goes on, we started moving up. These are our different absorbance values. And so the reason I'm stopping now is we're just not seeing much of a change anymore. So um, these are very um, subtle changes. And I think the last reading I'll take here is gonna be about 0.287288. So, I mean, we could um, continue uh, to observe this, eventually it would uh, completely plateau. In fact, maybe I'll come back um, in another 30 minutes or something and take one last final reading. So while step three is happening in the background, while we're monitoring the absorbance change of our large tube, um, we can go ahead and move on to step four, where we're looking at the effects of the precursors. So what I'm doing here is we're holding the amount of silane constant, we're holding the concentration of silane constant, same thing, <laughs> um, but we're changing the amount of PBS. And so by changing the amount of PBS, we're changing the pH, and um, I think you'll, hopefully we'll see some differences in the size of the particles that we produce. So, um, I've already done step 4A, so I've labeled these three tubes. I've already um, added 3.5 mLs of water and 500 microliters of the polyethylamine. So now to the, two point the 25 microliter one, I'm going to add 25 microliters of my buffer, phosphate buffered saline, to my 500. I'm going to add 500. And to my three and a half, I'm going to add three and a half. I'm sorry, two and a half. So there's half. There's one. Two. So now I'm on 4E and I'm going to add 500 microliters of our hydrolyzed silica precursor to each. So everything is constant here except for the amount of buffer, the amount of phosphate buffered saline. So let's go give these a quick spin. So it doesn't. And we can set it and forget it. Okay, so here we are now at the end of about an hour. And so you can appreciate how much the color has changed on this. Um, here's just a comparison to uh, water. Um, and then if we look at our different concentrations, um, you can appreciate this is our 25 microliter the 500 microliter and the 2.5 ml. So you can see these uh, differences in the ex extent of the reaction. Okay, so we're now on day one, part five, collect the nanoparticles. So I've prepared a 
uh, balance tube right here. One of the important things about a balance tube is that you may think, well, I just always have the same volume, but you actually need the same mass, right? And different materials have different densities. So for things when you spin really fast, you want to weigh both of them. And so um, that's what the instructions there in 5A mean. So now I'm going to centrifuge uh, for 15 minutes. So I've got this rotor here. I need to put its hat on. So the reason we're using this one is it can just go faster than the centrifuge that's in the teaching lab. So if I hit this, it's right now on um, RPM, revolutions per minute. I want to hit it again and turn it into units of G. So that's also relative centrifugal force. So speed, I want 6,500. So 6,500 times gravitational force. Time, I want 15 minutes, enter. And then these are just some other parameters. This is how fast does it accelerate and how fast does it decelerate. And I want it to do both of those things very fast. Start. And so up we go. And we're going to record this for 15 minutes and make you listen to it. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so end of run. So we can go ahead and open it up. And so what you can hopefully appreciate is this pellet of particles right there. And so you can kind of see there's there's still some cloudiness, but it's definitely less cloudy. So what we're going to do now is now try to uh, recover those particles. So th the first thing I'm going to do is just decant um, the supernatant. So, so decant is just a fancy word for pouring off. And you might think that I need to be super careful about this pellet, but they're actually surprisingly stable. And so I'm just going to really simply pour the uh, supernatant off, being gently gentle but not over the top. And then I'm going to kind of very carefully try to get that pellet to resuspend. What did I, I think I say three or four mLs of water in the protocol. So you can kind of just, so this is a good time to maybe put it in the sonicator and vortex it. So one thing we can do first is vortex it. And then we're going to put it in a sonicator bath. So what's a sonicator? It's basically a bath of water and it's going this underneath this uh, bath is a ultrasound transducer that's going to put ultrasound energy into this water bath. So when I turn it on, nope, when I turn it on, you can hear it and you can even see it. Hopefully the video comes through where you can see the water kind of pulsing. So if I turn it off and then turn it on again, you can see the energy uh, being put into the water. So I'm just going to put the sample in there. And so this is going to just break up these aggregated particles um, using this acoustic energy. Okay, so this has been five minutes or so um, in the sonicator. And so there's a little bit of bubbles on the side, but by and large, I'm pretty happy with this sample. So if I would not have been happy with it, I would still see kind of aggregates or particle chunks at the bottom. And that's, I'm not seeing that. So I'm pretty happy with this sample. So what we've done, we started with about 
30 mils, we concentrated it to a pellet, and we suspended it in 4 mls. So we've kind of concentrated this. So that's why this hopefully looks a lot darker to you. Okay, so we're at the end of day one. So this is step six. Um, and so sometimes people have trouble getting what we're doing here. So let me just kind of walk you through it. So this is our tube of nanoparticles, right? So at t equals zero, we have no nanoparticles. And at t equals roughly 60 minutes, we have lots of nanoparticles, right? And then we did a centrifuge step. And we had our nanoparticles at the bottom of the tube, right? Then we poured off all of this liquid and resuspended these in a smaller amount of liquid. So now the nanoparticle concentration is a lot higher, right? But how much higher? What is this concentration? So that's what we're going to do now in this next step. I've got about four mLs here. So what I'm going to do is take three little tubes and each of them are going to have a base mass. And actually it's going to be mass 3 initial, mass 2 initial, mass 1 initial. Okay, so that's the mass of an empty tube. Then I'm going to take 500 microliters and put it in here. And it has the same concentration of nanoparticles as my master tube, right? Okay, then I'm going to heat. And I'm going to come back in a few days and all my water is evaporated, but I do have a bit of nanoparticles left at the bottom. And now when I measure this again, it's going to be M1 final flying marker, M2 final, and M3 final. Okay? So if I do mass final minus mass initial, the mass is only, assuming I didn't melt my tube, the mass of the nanoparticles, right? And therefore, since I know the mass of the nanoparticles, and I know how much I put in the tube here to begin with, which is 500 microliters, I can determine concentration of nanoparticles in milligram per mil. So that's pretty cool. And then, if I'm really smart, and I know the volume of one nanoparticle, and I know the density of the material. This is density. And volume. And I know how much mass I'm starting with. I can determine the number of nanoparticles per mL. So I'm starting with milligrams per mL, and if I know the density and the volume, I can determine the number of nanoparticles per mL, which is kind of like knowing the molar volume. Right? Moles per liter. Okay? So the only thing I need to know then about my volume, 4 thirds pi r squared, 
sorry, cubed, 4 thirds pi r cubed, is I need to measure the radius, which we're going to do on day two. Okay, but right now, um, I didn't videotape myself weighing these empty tubes, um, but I recorded these values, and you want to record those before you put in the material, obviously. And so now, we're just going to come back and carefully weigh out 500 microliters. into tube one, tube two, and tube three. Okay, so now the only thing I need to do is just evaporate the water. So these are labeled A, B, and C. So we're gonna put them in a drying oven So I have this set to about 70 degrees C, so enough that the water will clearly evaporate it, but not so hot I'm going to melt my plastic. And in it goes, and just like Ron Popeil will set it and forget it and come back in a day or two. <laughs>